Hello, everyone. My name is The Renegade Statman, and a very warm welcome to today's show. I'm joined by my co-host, former Ipswich, Newcastle, West Ham and England midfielder, Kieran Dyer, and the man in the hot seat today, David Didzy McGoldrick. A uh, very warm welcome to the show. And can you tell us a little bit about the, the last 24 hours or so for you? Uh, yeah, thanks for having me. It's um, been a hectic 24 hours, yeah. Um, had a medical down at Derby, um, signed there, got that all sorted yesterday and today. Um, but yeah, happy, happy that it's all sorted now. Being out of a club ain't, ain't great. So it's great to get sorted in a, a good club like Derby. Ipswich's uh, promotion rivals, hopefully. Well, yeah. hopefully, hopefully you're not. Hopefully we're not <laughs> right. But yeah, you'll be back yeah. at Portman Road, which I think... I did. I did. I did. I look for that fixture. I did look for that fixture when I seen Corletti. Uh, I'll ask you the question now because it will come up near the time. Uh, will you celebrate if you score against us? <laughs> no, I've got, I've got too much respect for the Ipswich fans, so no. Fantastic. One one question that, that, that came through, we've got some fans' questions as well, and I'll try and thread some of them in, 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 with, in with the interview. Um, but this one came from Alistair Rattray that said, he'd love to know whether you would contemplate signing for, for Norwich and uh, why is the Forest Derby divide not as big as the Ipswich Norwich one? Good question. Um, the Forest Derby um, thing is it, big, you know. I think not. They've got a big rivalry, just like Ipswich and Norwich. Um, one thing that I didn't come from Forest to Derby. I got released there uh, ten years ago, so it was a long time ago. Um, and also, uh, I'm a not, I'm a Notts County fan, uh, so it's a bit different. Um, I do get the rivalries and everything, but. I still know about the, the good club about Derby County, but if would I go? To, would I have gone to Norwich? If it was in the same league, no. Uh, any football you can be, I can come here and say no, I wouldn't. But if you're getting offered a deal that's to protect your family, would you go? And you haven't got nowhere else to go. Are you out? Are you going to be unemployed, or are you going to get a job to feed the family? Then let him answer that himself. Yeah. Good point. Let, let's take you. So, Derby fans, you, you can switch off now because the the focus now will be on 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 Didzy Zipswich uh, career, um, and we look forward to seeing you at Portman Road next next season. Um, I want to take you back first of all to April two thousand and five. It was the uh, FA Youth Cup. Um, obviously, you played against Ipswich there. In fact, you you scored a pen in the first leg, um, and I think you said the second leg that it was your biggest disappointment. I was just kind of not wanting to rub it in, but just kind of want to know what it was from a from a, a you know from the the losing team's perspective of that game. It was it was goes down. You know, I always still think about it to this day. I think the team that we had, you know, we had some names: Lalana, Walcott, Dyer. Um, it was boys like Martin Craney and Matt Mills who were the best centre halves in Asia, England at the time. Leon Best, um, Gareth Bale. You know, <laughs> you know, we had the team that everyone thought we were going to win. Um, we won the first leg, yeah, scored a penalty. I think Fia or Bestie scored the second one. It might have been Fia. And then we just didn't turn up at Portman Road. And, you know, fair enough, they beat us. I think the boy the, the boy that scored the, right the winning goal was Upson, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so every time I tried to play against him, and I, I always tried to smash him, but I couldn't get near him. <laughs> but <laughs> uh, Yeah, but no, I do regret. It would have been great, you know, uh, FA Youth Cup, you know, you see boys say it. Like that, I've gone on to do big things. They always say, mention they won the FA Youth Cup, so it would have been nice to have. Um, but you know, it weren't meant to be. But obviously, it's great memories playing with with, the, with them kind of boys in the youth team. Some players that youth team had. Uh, oh. We, I, we had Darren Bent on, and he was just below the age groups of the FA Youth Cup team. And we were saying, for us to win the FA Youth Cup, did we produce enough players? And then you look at your team. <laughs> Who we beat and the players yeah. produced and probably the transfer fees, it's crazy. No, it's it's scary now when I think about it. All the players that had it went on, like especially Gareth and Fear, I think they were the more quieter ones out of us. You know, we lived in a in a lodge, like 20 boys used to stay in a lodge. We used to get looked after by a lady called Jules. And you can imagine 20, 16 to 18 year old boys in a lodge, like all sorts happens. We were sneaking out, we, you know, we were going to parties, you know, 
two boys that never came out, Gareth and Theo. You know, they they had the head, they knew that it was going to be big. Gareth, not necessarily. Theo, you knew that it was always going to be big. Uh, but Gareth kind of just like, just like that, you know, he, he just sprung into this man overnight. He came and he was a timid boy. And he came back pre-season literally and like, he was confident. He was out the room. He was making jokes with people, winning the ble- like the, the first te- day of pre-season, beating all the scores on the jumps and that. And we were thinking, okay, now he's, he's come back a little bit. And literally, he was just a different guy. And what he's done, obviously, we all know what he's done. But I've seen him a few times the past seasons when um, we played against Spurs and that um, for Sheffield United. And he's still the same, you know, little boy. Still looks like he wants to play Dobby around the corner. You know, he's still got that guy. Did, did you... Who, who? This was a question from East London Tractor Boy that said, at that time, who did you think out of all of those superstar names that you listed, who did you think would go the furthest in the game? Uh, Theo. Because Theo was, Theo was a year younger than us. So he was coming out of school and training with us. And his pace was, like... Different, it's like UK, but you probably coming through at them age. Not now, not, not, I know, not no, now. but I know. Yeah. I remember coming up against him, and I was rapid, and then yeah. he had an extra couple of gears. Then, yeah. and you're going, yeah. what the hell? Yeah, he was rapid, but he could finish as well. Like he wasn't one of them. He wasn't like as you call it in football, came. He wasn't a speedboat with no driver. You know, he, he he literally could finish. Like he could strike the ball well in, when he was finishing. Um, and we, there was just a hype around him. So he was the one that you would say he was going to. But the best technical for me was the Lana. Um, yeah, the <laughs> Lana for me, like, he come in and I, I remember the first couple of weeks in training, I was just like, is this guy left footed or right footed? Like, uh, I'm, what? But he had a, he had a problem. I went, like, he had a, something wrong with his body and he missed like a year. Mm. So it set him back a bit and he lost his confidence a little bit and then he started to build it back and then, Obviously, what he's done, he's done. But as a player, as technical wise, as ability wise, Lallana was was the guy. But fear, we all knew was going to make it. Well, fast forward to January 2013. Um, you're age 25 at, at that point. Uh, you join it, which on loan from Forest. You'd, the previous part of that season, you'd been at Coventry in League One and scored fantastic 17 goals in 26 appearances. And it was rumoured that Ipswich were had been watching you. I mean, just how, how did that situation come about from leaving Coventry, going back to Forest and then coming to Ipswich, I guess? Yeah, well, I think Coventry was a, at a crossroads for me. I, was, I didn't do very well at Forest. And then I needed to go play some games. Uh, Coventry went too far from my house in Nottingham, went there, got my head down, uh, scored some goals. And I remember we played against Colchester. Um, I scored a goal and someone said... Uh, Mick McCarthy's in the, the stands and, you know, instantly Mick was a big name, big pull in the championship at them times and you think to yourself, oh, are they, they going to be interested in me? Like, not, I remember before when I was, before I went Coventry with no disrespect, it was like Scunthorpes and Doncasters that were looking at me and then to get a manager like uh, Mick coming to watch you and then wanting to take you when it happened, um, I got the call and, and yeah, I wanted to make it happen. Um, he was a big pull. I knew the club. I knew Chamber as well very well. Um, so he was um, trying to bring me down here, and yeah, it worked out, and and I'm glad it did. One of the one of Mick's kind of like right head right hand men was Dave Bowman. Was yeah. Dave Bowman instrumental in telling Mick about you, or did Mick already know about you? Because when we're talking, I always talk about recruitment is the most important job for a manager or a coach, and. Fans can have a lot to say about Mick and his style of play, but we, not just loan players, but players he brought in were top, top draw. And I think that was because of Dave Bowman. Yeah, I think he has a lot to say in it. He he trusts whatever Dave Bowman says. I think they've got a relationship. They're friends now. They've been friends for a time, I think. One of them, and I think he would have come and watched me and then he would have given the heads up for Mick to come and watch me to give to, to tick it off, basically. And they've got a fantastic relationship, you know, uh, him, Terry, Mick, they're all great friends. And, you know, I think every manager, like you say, they need that. They need people who they can trust. And if your man is telling you to go watch this player, then I think they take their, they take their word for it. You, you made your debut for, for Ipswich away to Villa in the, in the FA Cup, uh, coming on as a sub for Jet. Just kind of what your, your view on the, the, 
your your squad assessment of, of he's the laughing players. about the name Jet, by the way. <laughs> no, <I'm> <laughs> he's laughing at Jet. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. Never. Sorry, should I, should I call him Jay Emmanuel Thomas? I, I, no, I'm call him Jet. I just ain't. I just ain't heard the name Jet for ages. No, I, just, <laughs> no, I get why they call him a nickname Jet. Um, <laughs> obviously, in that in that team, you you had some sort of a. Uh, uh, older pros in Chopra, Daryl Murphy, Jason Scotland, you, um, Lee Martin, Nigel Rea Coca, and then yeah, low knees. We had Patrick Kisnorbo, Aaron McLean joined the same time as you. Uh, I think DJ Campbell was probably there, and then the younger players. You no, had. DJ wasn't there. No, no, he wasn't there. No, Cresswell, um, uh, Luke Hyam uh, was there. What was your assessment of the team that you joined back in uh, January 2013? You know, when I came into the dressing room, uh, it was quiet. Like, some of the names, the older you're saying like that, like the kids know both. Jason Scotland. Jason Scotland was a, you know, a big character in the dressing room. Um, there was quite a few lads. Dale Murphy as well. Uh, Crazy. So coming from Coventry in League One, you know, people don't realise the, the difference from League One to the Championship is massive. Like, you could say people from the championship to the top half of the Premier is massive, but top championship teams and like the bottom half of the Premiership teams, there's a difference, but not massive. But from the championship to League One, there is a big difference. Um, and going in there to see him, you know, names that you all know, but it was all good. And uh, yeah, I remember that debut. Uh, I think I came on, I think. Um, I think, yeah, the likes of Choppers and Merce, I'm not sure who started, maybe Jason Scotland might have started. Um, but yeah, it was that calibre caliber of players. Um, and I knew I was up against it to, to get games coming in from a boy from League One. So, you know, look, it worked out. Do you remember in that January that a certain player came to train and keep it up? <laughs> yeah, I do know that. I, I do remember that. <laughs> I do remember that. I, do I got offered a contract after that one. Uh, I know. That contract after that one training uh, session with you lot. And I remember, I remember it. I remember we were training, we were training on the back, the back bit, weren't it? Near the yeah, back of the day. I remember it. Yeah, yeah, I remember it well. And I was like, Jesus. And I, I was like, Jesus. I'm like, training with Kieran Dowd. I was trying to play it cool. <laughs> <laughs> but like, you know what I mean? But yeah, I remember you still had it then. So I'm surprised. I, said, I think I sent crazy for an ice cream, did I? Give him a step. Oh, yeah. and read that way and the lads were buzzing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, and one thing that. I can remember, obviously, we'll get to the bit about the book when you're wrongly named. Not my fault, by the way. Not my fault. yeah. But, uh, <laughs> I even say that you and Cresley with the best, you could even tell from that hour's training session I had with you that you and Cresley were the best players. But what shocked me at the time was I thought Tyrone, Ming, uh, Tyrone Mings was horrific. <laughs> I'm like, bloody hell, where's this kid yeah, going? Yeah, yeah, yeah. His feet were all gangly, he was like n a nervous wreck. And I'm like, and then to see him go and do what he done is fair play to him because I would have never ever predicted yeah. from that first trade decision. Yeah, I'm exactly the same. Exactly the same. Like he was just dangly. He, the one thing that Mick signed him for is because he had an unbelievable spring on him. He could run. He had that body, like perfect body where you you can't put in a body fat on. He's got wide shoulders. He looked the part and he cost, you know, he was a mortgage advisor before, so he didn't cost anything to get over us. And fair play for taking a chance on him. But yeah, first sessions, he was horrendous. Uh, first months, he was horrendous, but he gradually got into full time. Um, he has a confidence about him. Can remember how confident he was? I know. I couldn't believe it. I was yeah. thinking to myself, this boy needs yeah. to take it down because he can't even kick the ball. Like I said, that is such a great, I love stories like that where yeah, yeah. he's proven people wrong. And what we paid 50 grand from him or something like that from non league and 50 grand in a bag of balls, yeah. He's made the Euro Championship final and I know Villa's captain, like he's flying now. And I, I still speak to him now, you know, he, he's a good lad, um, and fair play to what he's doing. And he knows it as well, like he knows where he's come from and how he was at Ipswich at the stand. But even when he got into the Ipswich team, like he'd done well when he got in, mm. um, and then got his move to Bournemouth for the injuries. But yeah, he's done really well. Start. I hope his first goal weren't against me when I signed for Middlesbrough. Hopefully he scored a few before then. No, Talk it would have been, you know. Oh, my God, it's getting worse yeah. and worse. <laughs> fired him from outside the box. Yeah, yeah great. No, that would have been his first Keeper's goal. Keeper's got to save that. 
Like, <laughs> did we, what was the score? Did we beat you? What was the score? 4-0. Oh, yeah. I think, yeah, Mick, I think crazy, Mick, was, Mick was ill. Terry took the yeah. game. And it was a typical uh, game. No disrespect to Ipswich. But I think when we looked at the stats afterwards, we had like 72% of the ball. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we lost 4-0. And I'm yeah. just thinking... Oh, no, Tommy Smith, Tommy Smith scored two, I think. Did he? It might have been me. I think me and Aaron McLean scored. Did you? I, I know you I'm scored. I'm trying to you think, would, yeah. You yeah, yeah, yeah. That's my, I think I, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Welcome, Ipswich Town fans. See, I got you on your, Ipsh- on your way for Ipswich. <laughs> Back to it. Uh, the, yeah, I've, I haven't got to that bit on the screen. So, okay. yeah, I can't remember who the, four, who, who the goal scorers were. Um, but by the end of the, the season that you were you were on loan with us, uh, uh, you scored four goals in in fourteen appearances. Um, but goals seem to be at a premium for everybody. Murphy, Chopra, uh, Frank Nubel, he got or Nuble, he got two. You'd partnered them. You'd partnered Aaron McLean. Did it feel that there was something lacking in that strike partnership when you joined? Um, it was completely different. It, we was was fighting for our lives every week, you know, when Mick took over before I came, you know, there was rock bottom of the league, weren't there? So every week we was going out and like Kieran said, you know, they they come and had 72 possessions, but we won 4-0, you know, we, I don't think we were trying to, no one was trying to make a partnership. Um, we were just trying to get the points on the board at that time. And I was, my thing was if Ipswich stay up, then my transfer becomes permanent. So, you know, everyone's fighting for all different things at the time. You know, there was loads of lone players. Um, so it was different. So it was hard to do strike partnerships. But Murph wasn't... Murph was playing left wing and right wing. And, you know, he wasn't the Murphy that scored the 27 goal when, uh, you know, that time. Um, he was still finding... He like, had a late bloom from somewhere. Um, so it was all different. But So there was no partnerships. I didn't think me and Murph were going to be, like, partners next season together. It's, it's weird how that happened. One thing that... It doesn't annoy me because I know why the game, where the gays go with data. But I think it's hard to judge you on data. The same as like a Sonny Aluku at Ipswich. Sonny Aluku only scored two or three goals. Good player, yeah. And you're a striker and you're judged on goals, but you bring so much more. You help create overload. You help us control the game. Sonny Aluku is, like I said, if you compare him to Selena, Connor Chaplin and all these number 10s who played last season... His numbers were probably down on everyone else, but it's the subtle mm. things that manager sees that he, when you're under pressure and that, he'll just slow down the pace, he control the tempo. And I, yeah. I think, especially with you, stats can be very misleading. I always, I love when people bring up, well, you, he doesn't score enough goals. And I'm like, who's yeah. two, two, two or three of the greatest midfielders of our generation? Javi, Modric and Iniesta. <laughs> you, look how, honestly, you look how many yeah. goals they've scored. I yeah, think Rodrigo has only just scored 30 for Real Madrid in how yeah. many appearances? How many games, yeah. But what a player because it's the what they can do and how they slow down the game, they dominate the game. And yeah, I would, I no, would read your goals. Me, me. No, it's true. It's true. You have to, you have to kind of list, forget the noise sometimes, you know, when people talk like that. Obviously, Lucas had a great career himself and Managers pick him because they know what he brings. Players like will like him playing. Could have given the ball to him anywhere. He might not dribble past four people and cross it in for the guy to tap it, but he might dribble past someone and then pass it to another guy to then cross it. You know, it, it's how it works. And that's like my spell in the Premier League when I didn't score for, I think it was 24, 25 games or something, maybe more. But I was playing every week and he would have looked at it from the outside and thought, this guy, is out. how's he playing? But the way the team played, I was one of the key factors in it because I was coming out wide and overloading out wide, dropping into midfield and making an extra pass to make it 3v2 against teams. And when we was away from home, I was coming in the middle. But players, I love that. Players want me in the team and managers want me in the team. And that, as a player like myself, that's all that matters to me. Mm. Um, and that's, that's been the case for a lot for my career. So that's why my stats aren't high. Um, as they should be as a goal scorer, as you look at it. Um, that's just the way it is. It's all different kind of players. You'd be bored, though, if you were just told to stay up against the defenders and get in the six-yard box to score goals. Your head would be gone. I literally, I would not be able to do it. <laughs> I, I literally, we, got play, we had a player at Sheffield United, Billy Shot. He just li- sleeps in the six-yard box. Like, he, he, don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. Like, outside the box, he can hold it up. He can 
yeah. but he just breeds goals like he just wants yeah. it all the time. I'm outside on the edge of the D waiting for the pullback. I'm the guy switching out to the thing. I just wouldn't be able to do it. And sometimes I tried the managers telling me before the game, like, I remember Mick used to tell me, Dizzy, stay up front, like, don't come deep. You know what I mean? <laughs> Off time. <laughs> so, and I'm like, I just can't help it. Like, it's just my game. Like, it's just how I like to play football. Brilliant. I remember a game, talk, when you talked about Tyrone Mings, and as a fan, I did think, oh, I don't know if he's a great replacement for Cressy. And I did remember that sometimes when I was thinking, no, look, McGoldrick's having to come back into the left-back position to, to, get, the, to get the ball. So I always remember that. <laughs> yeah, I didn't mind that one either. <laughs> yeah, but he, he, he proved me wrong, so well done to him. I, I just want to speak about, so you missed the last five games of that season because of the 93-day the loan rule. And because what happens at any football club, then the rumours come out, which is, is he signing the two-year contract or isn't he signing it? What was the situation back then with regards to that? The situation was that it was in principle, I think, for it to go through, I think. But there was some weird clause or something that depended on Forrest. Uh, but Billy Davis, who was my manager when we first signed me, but he left, but he, went, he came back to Forrest. He rang me and he wanted to take me back. He wanted to... Um, kind of cancel like the permanent transfer or something that there was some kind of rule um, but Big big Mick put his foot down and I said absolutely no chance and I, and I, and I to myself I, want, I it's hard once you've been at Forest I would have had to be fighting for my place again and you know the fans were on me a little bit so coming to Ipswich you know I knew it was a fresh start and I knew that it took to me so I wanted to come Ipswich and I needed to get out of Nottingham as well playing and living there every day Good stuff. At the start of 13-14, um, Cole Skews came in, Jay Tab was a permanent signing and and Paul Anderson as well. Did it did it feel like it was becoming more of Mick McCarthy's team in, in his first full season with the as, as manager? Yeah, um them just them boys, yeah, you know, Tabby and Ando were basically out and out wingers. Um, you know, Tabby, you know, great lad, you know, he knew what he did, he, he would get it and he would get crosses in, and that's what what he did, there was no, he one of the only guys, not only guys, but he one of them guys in the team that just doesn't look like a footballer outside of football, um, doesn't care about anything, but just literally gets the ball. I couldn't even tell you what he's doing now. He, he, he could be a fisherman in an island or somewhere. I don't even know what he's doing. He was a better golfer than football, weren't he? <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, literally. You could ask, you, you'll ask him on a Monday. If you played, we played Saturday, Tabby, but like he wouldn't have a clue. Like literally, like. But he would just get the ball and he'll get crosses in. And he was a dream from Earth and that. But Scusi, like I know people have probably said it before, like, uh, and Scusi and Scusi probably be one of them, like about the stats thing. You know, he don't, he hardly ever scores or assists or nothing. But at that level. You know, I think he's perfect for the way, he, you know, he, he did a lot. He was, he was a really good player. Um, I know he got a stick at some times and some fans are pretty like Marmite, I think, at times down, down and there. Um, but, you know, he was important to our team and, and, you know, I think he was vital for the way we played. You had a young Teddy Bishop coming through as well. Young Teddy, yeah. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. If we'd have told you... In 2022, he would be playing in League One at Lincoln. No, I wouldn't have believed you at all. Yeah. yeah. No, I wouldn't have believed you at all. I, I, would, I would say the same, not in terms of ability-wise, but I'd probably say the same about Luke Heim as well. Okay, good. Yeah. In terms of, like, my first six months there of when we was on loan, I remember he scored a few goals and he was, I thought to myself, well, he's got a chance like, to be, like, playing championship, like, through his career. For sure. Things like that. Um, but obviously with injuries and, you know, other stuff that's happening, you know, with the judge tackle and things. And, I, you know, I think certain things happen. But, you know, a shame I thought he would have. And I know he's not playing at the minute and he's younger than me. Um, so, yeah. but he's, that's now football work. he's now manager of a local team, Woodbridge, around here. Yeah. And he's a manager. Yeah, he's a manager, Luke Hyde. <laughs> yeah, I bet he's got a bit of gym doing bench. <laughs> 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 Adible, that guy. Uh, yeah. It was a, it was a great start to you for that that season. You won uh, September's Championship Player of the Month. Um, mm. You scored against Borough. You scored a great goal for me. Uh, you, your second at home to Brighton, which for me showed your skills. You know, you, you've tactically, technically brilliant and and really fast feet. And by the end of December, you scored eleven goals. 
your, your partnership with, with Murphy seemed to be, you know, gelling a lot more. Town was seventh in, in the league. Did you, you know, a positive start for your, you know, your, since you joined as, as a permanent player? Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, I remember the Brighton goal and I remember how well we were doing. Um, I remember everything was just clicking. Maybe it was because the new players that came in and there's a buzz around the place. Uh, but yeah, I remember that. I remember funding and I started well. Um, and yeah, I think probably, probably that and another season probably my best spell at Ipswich that first that first six months, I'd probably say, yeah. Um, I, I put the Ireland shirt on um, and I want to talk to you about Ireland because what the, the, the Irish national team started a, appearing on your on your radar. Um, uh, I'm just interested how a, a, a lad from from Nottingham um, then suddenly found themselves in the in, in the green shirt of Ireland. <laughs> yeah, well, long story. They've been when I was younger, they was flirting around it. Um, well, another long story. I was adopted as a kid, so when you have to play for uh, the national team it has to be from your blood it can't be from your parents that have adopted you or anything it has to be actual blood so they were circulating when I was younger um, because of my name you know, McGoldrick it's, it's, I, so they thought that I was at, um, through that but I have no I had no information about my birth parents or anything like that to find out and then when I got older um, I heard it was um wanting me to, to find out. Um, so when you get adopted, you you get a folder, basically. It tells you the information about your family kind of thing, but you can't look at it at a certain age or something. So yeah, got the story, found out I was Irish. Um, and yeah, um, I had a, a Irish grand, grandparents, full Irish. Um, so then they have to go to the FAI and they have to get all the passports checked and and all loads of stuff. It wasn't plain sailing. You have to get all passport checks and everything to make sure it's thing. And yeah, and they did that, and it all went through. And I got an Irish passport. Uh, Rumours that Scotland approached approached you as well. Is that true? <laughs> I think when you're scoring goals, I think every uh, national team other than England, I think, approach you. I think <laughs> I, I don't know Jamaica, I think, you know, the, the teams. And I thought, well, I don't know anything. I mean. <laughs> Okay, so uh, fast forward to February 2014. Uh, we're at home to Blackpool. Ireland manager Martin O'Neill is is in the stand to watch you. Um, and at, you know, by the end of that, well, in that game, you get injured and you're you're out for ten weeks with a, a knee injury. You'd scored 16 goals and 34 appearances at that point. How how did you feel after you'd gone through that whole process of of um, making yourself eligible for Ireland? Yeah, that one hurt me. Um, that did hurt me because I felt like I was in. Really good form there, you know. I felt, you know, like I say, stepping up from League One to the Championship, you know, I felt my feet. And for the few years at Nottingham Forest, um, I wasn't cutting it well. I shouldn't be, but I actually thought I found my feet like every week here. Like I'm a, I'm a, I felt like I'm a danger man. And then to get injured like that when I knew Martin O'Neill was in the in the stands, and plus, you know, how well Ipswich was doing at the time, uh, it was tough to take. Um, but you know, I had the aim to to try to make it back for the for the end of the season and to support the boys as you can. It sounds cliche, but uh, you kind of have to think like that at the time. Um, you can't get too upset about it. Um, I was still young. I was still 24, so uh, I wasn't worrying about anything other than that. Really, just about the end of the season, getting back hopefully for the playoff. Did Did it make things better or worse for you when Daryl Murphy got the call up potentially in in, in place of you? No, 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 Murph was a good friend of mine. Kieran would know that. Like, I me and Murph got on really well off the pitch as well. So, and he was, you know, he'd been out the Irish fold for a little bit, and to hit, him getting back in, you know, he wasn't. So I was buzzing for him. So, um, you know, he, he loved it. Eh? He's, he's he's a really good friend of mine. I still speak to him now. You you visit when when you're out, out injured. You visited. Um... Bill Knowles in in America, who was a, a strength and conditioning coach, was it was that normal or was that something specifically done done for you? Uh, I don't think anyone else at Ipswich has done it really. Um, I think because at the time uh, things were going well and to get back for the playoffs, you know, I think they come with the idea to go over there and and try to speed it up and learn different things and. And it helped, I think. It was, you know, with a week over there, me and one of the physios, Alex Chapman, and 
it was good. He's different, you know. He did the likes of uh, Tiger Woods, you know, the top name that he, he's treated for certain injuries, and the way the Americans they do things. It's you know, 2050 stuff. They say like after you do the cruise ship, they have you in the pool like the next day or something. Do after operation, they have you doing things, and you look at you like what like but they're so advanced and so ahead and the facilities and you know just going over there to experience it you know um i still use the techniques since i've been injured and, and other things you know i think ipswich do their, their physio with recording it every day so i think when they get knee injuries i think they use some of them techniques um still to now so yeah it was good um did it speed it up who knows uh but it was a good experience anyway you ever done anything like that? Tyro, Tyro, Tyro Mings, obviously, when he did his cruciates at Bournemouth back to back, I think he went out to Michael Johnson, the sprinter Michael Johnson's got yeah, yeah. rehab facility. And I think he went and done all these rehab over there. So it's pretty uh, common knowledge now that footballers go and source, try and source the best possible people. Yeah. Um, because at football clubs, you can have six, seven people injured and you don't get that one on one love that you, you really want and desire. Exactly that, exactly that. At, at the end of the season, uh, you won the, the that, that was, you, unfortunately, you didn't, get, you didn't get back into the team that, that season, um, but you still won the Players Player of the Year Award. Um, one of the things I've kind of picked up with, with Kieran and, and interviewing other players is that that probably means a great deal to you. Yeah, it did. It did. I, 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 oh, I'll spin the camera around. I got the trophy in my cabinet there. Um, it did, and I remember the day I, we had a I had a um, appointment in London on the Players Award night. Me and the physio, and um, and I wouldn't have got back in time or something. But Mick was like, "You got to get back." Like everyone's got to be at this award show, and I never clocked on or nothing because I've been injured for ten weeks. I was thinking, I, I don't feel a part of it a little bit in terms of like you know I thought someone else go you know it's like Kieran and then now make sure he gets back make sure he gets back like kind of thing I was thinking it was just Mick just you know Alpha strike, yeah striking orders like oh I better get there otherwise I'm going to get told off so I had no inkling I was going to get it uh, no idea um, and obviously yeah it was my first my first one being a um, professional footballer so well, at a professional club so you know I remember it fondly yeah and I was shocked that I got it to be injured for so missing the second half of the season to still get it you're also third in the supporters vote and you won the away supporters player of the year as well. So um, you definitely made your mark in that. So we moved to 2014-15, new signings come in. Uh, Kevin Brew, uh, Bart comes in as keeper. Um, Ballant Biner, Ballant Bajner came in. Um, <laughs> Jesus, yeah. yeah. Uh, Connor Salmon on loan and, 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 and like KD said, but, you know, younger players like Bishop. Uh, you start the season on the on the bench. We're at home to to, to Fulham, um, and and you come off, it scored. It felt like it as fans. It felt like you hadn't been away. What was it like for for you? Yeah, it was good. It was, I remember that game. It was, it was a good feeling. It was a good buzz around. First game of the season, Fulham just got relegated. I think Scott Parker was playing in the middle. Um, they still had some big names there, um, and I think I think. Gaffer brought me on in the first half. I think he did. I think Mick brought me in. Oh, yeah. I think he brought me in after, I think Ballad Bajner started up front. He had a good pre-season, you know, and he thought, oh, we, we found one here. I think he had an absolute stinker the first half. <laughs> like, Mick was like, get, like, did he get warm? And he, he's, Gaffer, was like, I'll call him a bit, but he's still, he, he, he still does that. He always turns around half an hour. Go get warm. And you think, oh, he's spewing, but you don't think he's going to do nothing. And then I remember it was like 40 minutes. He's, get your stuff off. And I was like, I'm a, he's like we're coming on now came on anyway but I think that was better just to get myself a little uh, a little run around to get a blow uh, and then yeah scored the uh, the second goal I remember yeah dropped on the edge of the box um, and I think that was the first time I've striked a ball properly coming back from my injury kind of thing I've done the side foot and all that but when you have knee injuries you, there's certain things that play on your mind I remember I just it dropped to me and I thought I'm just going to lash it. I think it might took a little deflection um, and that was a good feeling. You know, obviously scoring the first game of the season as a striker, it gets that weight off your back. You, um, uh, towards the end of August, you uh, played against Norwich. Uh, we, we lost at home to them. Um, the question I'm always kind of interested in as a fan is, do, do, 
did you hurt as much as fans did in that? How did you know? How how, how did that game go for you, go for you? No, we did. We did. You know, obviously, I but not as much as fans. It's impossible. Like you know, people that have lived in Ipswich the whole time and you know, sport club. For me to say we felt it as much as you, then I'd be lying again. But we felt it though, other, more than other defeats, obviously, as players. And you know, we had local boys in the team as well. So uh, you know, like Tommy and Luke at the time. You know, they that's all that them games might massive to them. Um, so we all cared, and we was all good. There's no bad eggs there, so we all cared about it, and we knew that we hadn't beaten for ages as well. Um, and I think at that time, the dominance. I think I could hold my hands up now. I think. Norwich was so much better than us all the time to play them. I think their quality that they had, you know, we come close a few times, a few draws and that, but, um, you know, they had some good players in their team, I think, at the time. I think they went, did they go up that year as well? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they did, so, yeah. Yeah, they did, yeah. So, you know, they they was good. Wes Houlihan, uh, he's, I played on my island, he's a magician, underrated player, like, he is literally a magician. Um I had them ticking, um, the Bradley Johnsons, Cameron Jerome's at the time. They were pumping money, um, good players. So, but we felt it. Yeah, we felt it. Not as much of the fans, but yeah, we definitely, we definitely felt it. Sorry to go back, Dizzy, because because you were we're well into your Ipswich career. But I think a big piece that the Ipswich fans would like to know is obviously you crossed paths with George Burley at Southampton. Is that right? Yeah. Yes. Yes. How did yes. you find George? Because obviously. George was instrumental in myself and Richard Wright and everyone coming through and to have a playing career that the way he did and to have a career as a manager the way he did, he's 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 got a big part to play in this club's history. And obviously I know that he was the Southampton manager when you were all coming through. So you yeah, heard about George and how he was for you. I love George. I honestly did. I'm not just saying it to say like he gave me like I played under Harry Redknapp at Southampton. Um, it was like Nigel Pearson give me a game here and there. Um, I think that was after George. But yeah, George, he was the first one that made me proper into the, the first team player at Southampton. Uh, he used to love me. He used to, he played me left wing. He used my pace, Kieran, as you know, I'm a really quick guy. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I bet um, you didn't stay out there. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I think I was playing defensive at one time. Mine, exactly, yeah. Yeah, um, but yeah, he used to tell me to get on the ball, run at players, go run at players, give you, give us something like, and it was the first time I've had a bit of like free spirit, even though I was only 18, 17. And as a character, you know, some of the, yeah, he's, he's a character, I won't go too much, but yeah, yeah he used to come in red-eyed a few times and, uh, <laughs> as an 18 year old, like, you know, ooh, like, <laughs> But yeah, I seen him loads of times when we were at Ipswich. Um, used to see him, he used to be around and see him and David Lloyds or something. Uh, always speak to him and um, he always tells me the same story. I kick up my ass and uh, so. But I got a lot of time for George. Yeah, good, good, good. Is he still around the club? Is he still around the club now? Is he still around? He's at most games. Well, well, Chris Hogg is his um, son-in-law. Yeah. Um, Chris Hogg, he's obviously MK Don's uh, yeah, yeah. manager. So... He goes to watch MK Dons quite a bit, but he's always in the director's box at uh, home games at Ipswich. So uh, oh, okay. yeah, I'm sure he'll be there for Ipswich Derby next year. <laughs> be shy at me. I don't, I don't, I could be shy at me. As, as the summer transfer window was about to close, there was rumours that Leicester City had, had bid £7 million for you um, and you weren't in the squad uh, for for the next game, which was ironically away to away to Derby. Can you kind of tell us now about that that whole situation and 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 how how you how you felt about that? How I felt? Uh, did I want the move to happen? Yes, because the Premier League at the start. Never played in Premier League. Um, Right next to my daughter. At this time, my family was still uh, in Nottingham at the time. Um, so th- there'd be no moving or nothing at the time. Did I want it to happen to go to a Premier League club? Wages completely. Like I said before, 18 months ago, I was, without disrespect, I was going to Doncaster, Scunthorpe, then landed at a big club at Ipswich. And then similar sized club wanted to take me in the Premier League. 
if you, if, you, if the footballer doesn't want that to happen, then you know I think you're in the wrong sport basically. So did I do anything to forfeit or anything like that? Did I? I think there was rumours that I didn't play for that derby game to forfeit. No, I was actually generally injured. Like, and I I spoke to Mick and I told him I said, "What's it going to take to to happen?" Um, he said, "If it gets to this figure, it will happen." And that was it. The conversation, and I don't think they got to that figure. I think they bid. I think they wanted nine or something. They got to eight or something. But yeah, I know it. It just didn't happen, and that was it. Like, was I upset for a few days? Uh, yeah, um, but I signed the contract long after, and you probably get onto it. But I moved the family up, and that was it. Did it hurt me? Yeah, obviously, because I wanted to play in the Premier League, and you know, you see them going to win the league or whatever and you think would that have been me would I have been in Premier League and one of my best mates Wes Morgan was there at the time um, so you know I remember I had him ringing me like saying oh what's saying the boys are saying you're coming and I think this is the story that if I was going there I'm not sure if it's that true but they might have pushed Jamie Vardy out I don't know how true it is but you know that's, that, that's another case to be reckoning it might have just been something but he wasn't playing at the time or he might have been wanting to move, but yeah, but I wanted to move. Yeah, people's footballer doesn't want to go play in the Premier League. Um, did I do anything to wrong to to say I wanted to do that? No, did I refuse to play? Absolutely not. No. Did you have any dialogue with the owner, with Marcus at all, or is it just you and Mick? Or did you actually get to speak to? Mark? No, I, yeah, I spoke to Marcus. Um, I spoke to Marcus. He, he was in Barbados, I think, um, on a sun lounger. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> that makes it even worse for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, trying to get hold of Mark. It was some, some plus one, two number, like some uh, random number. Got hold of him and um because Mick was as Mick's like genuine guy, he was like, I don't want to lose you, but if if you get this the figure I say if it gets to it, then I, I can't stand in your way. And I think the one time they might have got to that figure around it, um, so he said, uh get hold of Marcus. So I got hold of Marcus and I said to him, what's it, what's it going to take? Um, and he was, he didn't want to sell me. Wow. Literally told me, he said, what's McCormack for 12 million that summer? Mm. Or the summer of, yeah, I think it was that summer he went for 12 million to Fulham. And he was like, yeah, the 12 million for Fulham, I want this for you, like kind of thing. He's like, you're my son's favourite player. He's like, you're my, he says it's not going to happen and this was like really close to deadline day and I just I knew from the conversation with him that I knew it wasn't going to happen wow wow big if a big if big if yeah it's got some maybes yeah. mm. uh, you, you said that you obviously you, you, you kind of a little bit grumpy for a, a few days after but how, how did how did you get back to being motivated um at the time I don't know, actually. I can't answer that. I think, yeah, I went grumpy a little bit and not with the manager, just with myself. And I wasn't myself. Um, but I don't know. I think I just kind of got into my groove and then contracts happened. Um, and yeah, basically, that was it. I think contracts swindled it, I think. Also, players, though, for all the crap that could be going off the pitch, once you go on that pitch... It's like all your troubles go away. Is that exactly? Again, just loving the game of football. Yeah. And real professionals, like you said, he he could be. So I would have, I know I would have sulk, I'd have been like sulking, refused to speak into Mick. But then as soon as you pick, you go across that thing. It's about I'll show Leicester why they need to pay an extra yeah. two million pound for me or whatever it is. It's just yeah. the mindset of a of a pro. Yeah, literally, I think we had a game. I think the next, I think the next game after the derby game might have been like Millwall at home or something. And I think I scored that game or something. And then it was just all forgotten. And then I, you got to go in the mindset as okay, like maybe it might happen. They might come back in for me January or let's do something with Ipswich now. Like let's get promoted again if we had a good season last season. And then I could be in the Premier League with Ipswich. Basically, I was thinking so. I'd go into that mindset um, of, of trying to to score goals again. And you kind of forget about it after a bit. It, it, it happens. Yeah, you, you and you and Murphy scored in that in that game against Millwall, and by the end of the calendar year, or just you know, we we went briefly top 
on on Boxing Day when we beat Brentford 4-2. And and the partnership between you and, and, and Murphy was was on fire. Murphy had 17 by that by the end of the calendar year, and you you had seven. Mick McCarthy said that you were the best strikers in the in the championship. So I've got what well, a couple of questions. Um First of all, one from a fan at Ben's Life that said, did you ever think Murphy would score 25-plus goals in a, in a season? 25-plus, that's a big number. Uh, no. No. But did that, did that mean I think he was a, 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 not a good player? No, absolutely not. Like He was a good player. He was strong. But to score 25, like... Um, you got to be. Everything's got to happen, and literally that season, he was just bulging the net. And you know, I don't think he scored twenty five since then. You know, you know, twenty five people who scored twenty five goals a, a season in strikers are normally people that score twenty, score twenty five. You know, score twenty three each year. Like, um, but you know, from coming from scoring ten maybe the season before to getting a high number like that, no. But as the season was getting on, and he was wasn't going to miss every time he got a chance he wasn't missing so maybe for the season you're thinking Jesus yeah it, it, it's getting higher now and um, by the start of the season I would, have, I would have never have called it but I knew how good of a player was and he was going to score goals and he brings so much more especially the way we played on the mix um, you know he was a, a focal point of, of hitting him um, from full backs and, and corners and, and everything so he had a big job to do and he, and he filled it well. Was, was there any talk at that point that you know we we went top on Boxing Day. Did you think actually you might be seeing Leicester the, the the following season in the in the Premier League? What was what was the mood in the camp? I was having promotion parties already. I think um, no, we 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 couldn't we couldn't get excited. I think people say, "Oh yeah, we're in the playoffs." You know, no one says no one talks about it. No one talks like if you hear footballers say it. And if we're top, yeah, we're not thinking about being at the top or anything. Of course you are. You know, if you're top of boxing day and you've got half a season, you're thinking, what if, like, if we keep this up, like, we can we can do it. So, obviously, that talk, I um, can't remember the time, how much of a talk it was. It was a long few seasons ago. Um, but, yeah, if, if there must have been some kind of talk. Chamber would have been fist pumping all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> what What is the biggest thing... Of that season, the biggest what if for me is that, like you said, we're top at Boxing Day. The transfer window's now coming. Come on, let's give it a go. Let's yeah. go. let's give it one go. Let's get two or three players in now who can maybe be that extra. And then it was quite a. Did we bring anyone in? In what did, we, what did we what did we do that transfer window? Fred, um, Freddie Freddie Sears came in. And then you're I like, to him. I think that was his best spell. Did he score some goals? That yeah, he scored, he scored some goals, didn't he? Yeah, he did. Yeah, but I know what you're saying. But yeah, you know, when you're top, more. you're top. Can we go yeah. out and just right now? Let's give it a right go because if it doesn't work out, then I could sell him Didzy in the summer for <laughs> 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 Get Leicester back yeah, on the back. You know, maybe, it, yeah. like, it was like when Nick Mick needed backing and you as players needed backing. It was like it it didn't come. Yeah, uh, then again, I don't, that's, that's, you, that's, I don't know how you felt as players, or you just thought the squad was good enough, or I'd, I'd... no, I, I generally think we we thought we had a good chance, and mm. if you can add a few players, I remember we signed Sears, he was from Colchester. Um, if we were signing some like good championship players, and it's, it's what ifs and maybes, but you don't know the relationship mm. what happened, you don't know if the gaffer if Mick wanted it, you don't know if, what shoot, shoot, what person. The, the owner was saying, you know, you know, you hear all these things about money and how much he was losing and all that. Maybe he was thinking, well, if I keep my purse closed and we still get there anyway, then, you know, he's saving himself some money. And then but you don't know. But yeah, it's what ifs and maybes. Hindsight now, yeah, I'd play to a, t to a team that's in the top two, in the, in the top of my boxing day, then it's probably going to happen. So, yeah. He, he also brought Luke Varney in and, and Chris Wood on. On loan, was Barney that was Barney was Barney that summer? Was, that January was it? Yeah, that's came... what I've written in my notes. If if it's wrong, I'll edit this bit out. <laughs> nah. Yeah, I, I thought Barnes was later on. Uh, I don't, he might he have came come back. back twice. Yeah, he came back a few he times. Back. I think. Oh, is yeah. that when he is that when he popped his Achilles? Yeah, 
yeah, because yeah. he did in the, in the in the Norwich playoff game, yeah, didn't he? Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Um, well, let, let's let's jump to that. Rother, Rotherham away um, in January. Uh, you uh, after that game suffered a, an injury which kept you out until the second leg of the the playoffs. Uh, you were on the bench at, at Carrow Road. You you came on. We were we were two one down after taking the taking the lead. And we were down to 10 men with Christoph Berra coming off. Did you as a striker think it's written in the stars that I'm going to come back and haul it switch back into the tie? <laughs> yeah, you think that as a striker, innit? But I think I remember I came on and I was way off it. Like, I think I only had two training sessions or something and I got first into it. Like I was so far off it. Um, but obviously, I think they just wanted to throw me on to, to do something. But uh, it wasn't meant to be. And obviously, that year wasn't meant to be in Norwich. Why not? Yeah, I think it was a bit too much. Uh, at Martin eighty eight says, would Tanner got promoted if you'd have stayed fit for the second half of that season? Mm. I think the answer is yes. When I win a lottery, if I put the right numbers on a few weeks ago, then you just don't know, do you? It's what ifs and maybes. Would they have been more stronger than as back myself and say yeah? But who knows? Who knows? Mm. June that year, you start for, for Ireland up front with Daryl Murphy in a nil-nil draw uh, against England <laughs> at the Aviva. Against um, England? Did we play our under-21s? <laughs> <laughs> Must have been a proud uh, moment for you. Yeah, I got dragged at half-time. <laughs> <laughs> half-time, you're off, didn't you? Uh, yeah, it was a proud moment for me, obviously, lining up when the sun was blazing, the pitch was dry as anything. Um, all of them was playing. Rooney was playing. I think it was Gaz Cahill and who was at the back of him? I think it was Jags. I think it was Phil Jagielka who you speak about. Yeah, I think it was Cahill and Jags and Wilshire was playing. Wilshire was, was I thought, oh, he, he's a proper player. Um, but yeah, it was good to play in front of Murph. But it was, a, uh, it was a horrendous game. I think ITV got uh, complaints from fans because it was so bad. Like, I got whipped at half time. <laughs> I got Rooney's shirt after the game, so that's one positive. England <laughs> Rooney's shirt, so that's one positive. Uh, unfortunately, you're on the bench for the uh, Euro 2016 qualifier at the Aviva against Scotland. But then at the start of the 2015 16 season, um, yeah, uh, more transfer speculation. Uh, interesting that you were linked with, with Derby back in, in August 2015, so it took you seven years to get there, but you then signed a new contract. Um, but things are looking positive, but, but we, we, signed, we, we signed Pittman and then obviously along with Freddie Sears as well, we've, you know, we've got Murphy Sears, Murphy Pittman, and um, you were on the bench more than, the, you know, starting on the, on, on the bench more. And what do you think changed at that point? Um... I couldn't even tell you. I think Pitts came in, Sears, he had that good end of the season. Um, Pitts come in, and I think he started all right. And obviously there's Murph. And I, I might just not have been been as 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 good form as I as I was. You know, um, I'm not sure who else was playing and what else for the team. Um, but I remember being out of the team for a bit, yeah. Um, Sears, he was doing well. Pitts came in, new sign as a new striker. When a new striker comes in, you're always going to get games. Um he has one of my friends, you know, I found myself more on the bench than, than what I was used to in the previous couple of years. Uh, Mark Beck asked a question which kind of came up. Mick McCarthy in October 2015 said that the more the fans chant David McGoldrick's name, that the less chance that I've, I'll bring him on. And, and Mark Beck's question was, how did it kind of get, how did it feel to be stuck in all of that, in that whole situation? Um, me knowing... The gaffer know me. No, I knew when he wasn't starting me. Um, I knew that the fans, the relationship I had with the fans and what the fans thought of me, I knew they would start seeing my name after a bit. And I can remember a couple of times I could hear like, oh, and I think, oh, shit, it's cool. And then like, I think to myself, this is killing me getting to be on here because Mick, like, he's so like, he's stubborn. Like, I love him to be so, like, I got no, he's just so stubborn. He would be like, no, that's it now, like, I'm, I'm, I'm in charge here um, but I don't think he did it on purpose like he always brought me on like I've never I don't think I'm a new sub I always come on but for that, just that, that minute I, be, I mean no 
that it would be it would be it'd be peeing him off. Um but that's as big as, as, as what he is. Um he decided to neighbor as well, didn't he? I think. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, I remember Selena, yeah. The more you keep cheering his name, I won't bring him on. Yeah. <laughs> Selena was Selena was a mad one. Selena was just a wild card when he first came. You know, he, I'm sure like he was trying to do step overs on the corner flag the first couple of days in training, and he was thinking, "What the guy? This this, this guy's a lunatic. How's he going to play on the mitt? Like kind of thing." He was free spray, <laughs> one, dragged the ball anywhere. Like he, in training, he was just not passing to anyone, and you could tell he was a good player. Um, but he come from Man City, and you know, he, he thought he was a lad, a great lad as a, as a, as, per, as what he is. He just thought, "How's he going to play on the mitt?" And obviously, you know, I think. That, the people in the wide might not have been exciting at the time. And, you know, if you, if you see a boy like Selena wanting to come on, uh, he's doing there now, like I still uh, read up, like, you know, the fans love him now, the fans want him back now. So that's what he was doing uh, in a team that might not be as, as fluent as they are now. So the fans are probably desperate to see someone like that. So I could see why they were doing it, but it just wasn't the right thing to do. One thing I remember about Selena, because I think I was doing the 16s at the time in that, how much he used to work after training, bag oh, of food. every oh, afternoon. Yeah. He'd be in the yeah, yeah, bang, bang, hundreds of free kicks, hundreds of shots. I'm talking about till four o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah, yeah. everyone's left the training going. It was just him, and I just thought he's got a chance, you know. He's yeah, you know, I get like with all the stepovers, but you think there's like a, a diva there, but he worked. He, he, you could see that he really wanted to perfect his craft and fair play. Yeah. He's one of the ones that just love football, like go home, watch all the football. And then after, you know, the, the cage thing where you go and you pass and then yeah, you see yeah. the coach and you do another one, he'll do another one, he'll be there. Like, and you have to tell, like, I remember TC used to go over there and like, get in that kind of thing. What are you doing? After training, free kicks, crossing, shoot, like everything. And fair play to him. Like you don't get many kids coming from, from the top clubs wanting to improve like that. Um, so fair play to him. Hopefully he still does it now because he's got a bit about him. November 2015, yeah, a groin injury keeps you out for three games, including the uh, Euro playoff game versus Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, and then in December of that month, you then tore your hamstring, which kept you out of training for, for 20 games. And was when that you returned. Yeah, yeah, that was the back heel. Back, mm. I remember that. The question I've got to ask is <laughs> when you went to Sheffield United, everybody's like, let's keep an eye on David McGoldrick at Sheffield United. And suddenly, whether they wrapped you in cotton wool or whatever, but you never got injured. But at, And you, you were what, older. What, what, I, what I think you want to say... Sorry, dude. So so basically, there's a few questions on, uh, from people if he wants to say their names, but they're saying they talk about your injuries and they're trying to... Like, some fans are thinking it's the commute. They think that you actually lived in Forest and was commuting in every day. If you give your side of the story and then... I'm going to tell an interesting story uh, about one of my coaching badges and I had to do a presentation on an Ipswich. And it doesn't surprise me that you went to Sheffield United and stayed fit. But yeah, if you just think, okay. just squash the rumours and you yeah. know, why your injuries and stuff. You can Kieran can back me up on this because you was around Ipswich at the time, so you would be seeing me. So there was this rumour that I was commuting. For the first year, after the Leicester thing, so after... <laughs> Before Leicester, um, I would train on a Monday, stay over on a Tuesday, train, go home, be with the family Wednesday, come back Wednesday night, you get normal sleep, you're back in, i got an apartment in Ipswich, Thursday, Friday, game Saturday, you go home Saturday, you're off Sunday, sometimes Monday. Fast forward, after the Leicester thing, I thought, right, it's not happening, I'm right, I move my family up. Me and my family bought a house on Bookersham Road, um, down the road from Tommy Smith. Um, lived there two, two years, I was there, two, two and a half years. So when these injuries happen, like these hamstrings, and people are saying, am I commuting from? No, I had my family in, in Ipswich um, kind of thing. And then it weren't later towards the on that my family, my oldest was starting senior school. Uh, so I know that I kind of have inkling that my contract wasn't going to get renewed. So do you start your boy that's not really confident into a new senior school and then take him out and go into a, another senior school when he gets to year eight or anything? So I moved him back to where all my family are. But then again, that's what I'm doing. I'm Monday night, 
I'm in a apartment. I had an apartment on Bookersham Road, right next to the golf course. Um, Monday night in the apartment. Tuesday train, go home, come back Wednesday. Thursday, Friday in the apartment. Saturday, if that's commuting, then I think there's a lot of commuters out there. Um, yeah, I was never training, never driving up on a day, going home, driving up, training, going back. Uh, that was only in the last year I was doing the back and forth because my family wanted to be back in Nottingham um, for school reasons. And they all go to that same school now. So I know personally that was the right decision for me to make. Um, but I knew I had inklings, obviously all the stuff that was going off with Mick that he might not be getting renewed. Um, I think I was the, the highest earner at the club at the time. Um, I think it was quite by not giving it, but I think it was quite by distance. So I knew they wanted to get me off the books. So I had inkling, so I had to kind of prepare for um, for what's going to happen at the end of the year. And I kind of knew that it was going to happen. I wasn't going to get a contract. So I'm glad he's touched that because it's one of the big what ifs about did he always injure the ifs, which even Teddy Bishop to an exchange. And listen, could be just bad luck. But um, when I completed my A licence, to change it up, my my presenter of the A license said, I want you to do a presentation that I am Marcus Evans and you are going in for a job interview for a manager's job. So it was brilliant. So there's me. I, I obviously, I knew the squad. Uh, you, you talk about recruitment, your style of play, you're showing clips of teams you work with and the style of play, the patterns of play you did. I also did things like, um, I'm quite fortunate that a lot of Premier League managers I'm friendly with, so I could get their loan players in. They could trust me with their players. I know all the big agents, stellar base, if we have to get players in. And then it got to, I was going through the squad. And at the time, Didzy and Teddy Bishop, I thought were the two most talented players in the squad. And I showed this highlighted of all the players that were, how many games they'd missed, how many games you'd missed. I think you'd only played like, 40% of all the games you could have been available for and Teddy's was even lower than that. Yeah, yeah. And I've got inside information. So Diz has talked about going to do rehab, rehab in America. The way the training ground used to be was that the treatment room was probably the size of your office, that. <laughs> Go on, Maybe smaller. The smallest treatment room ever. I remember speaking to BYU because I feel sorry for BY because physios are judged on players not being fit. And there was only one piece of equipment to treat players with. Mm -hmm. We're a championship club, wanted to go in the premiership, and there is one piece of equipment to treat players with. Yeah. And at the time, when I was at West Ham, it's funny because I used to be at West Ham and Rolsey was the physio. And because I was always injured at West Ham, Rosie got me to buy this machine. So we had one at the training ground, but he said, you need to be using this machine. So it was the Zaymar machine. So it's this thing you wrap around your leg, it pumps ice for your leg, or it can pump heat for your leg. And I use that every day when I was at Thing. I gave that to the football club. I said, here, Matt, can you remember? I said to Matt, take this. There's an, at least there's something else to try and get players back quicker. So yeah. when I did my presentation, I, I gave all the stats and saying, well, if you've got your two best players missing so many games, you can say it's bad luck. Because to be fair, the gym was good. So when you're doing certain rehabs, it's good. But for the early stages of injuries, if you've got no treatment to treat these players, then of course they're going to be out longer. Or of course they're going to break down. So yeah. I said, I would go to Marcus and say, what is my budget for players? Take 200 grand out of that. Because 200 grand, I will invest back into the medical. Yeah. Because it'll keep okay, 200 out. grand, but if 200 grand keeps him fit for 85% of the games yeah. and keeps Teddy for 85% of the games, then that is money well spent. And it is crazy again. Listen, because there's all this bloody agendas going around. Oh, I've got an agenda against the new regime. I've got an agenda against thing. No, I'm just giving players a chance to talk. But because we were cutting so much money at the football club, the, tri the, the, the treatment side of it, which is, again, when you're talking about recruitment, keeping players fit is the most important. Yeah. And we just neglected it. So when he's getting, oh, he's injury prone, Teddy Bates is injury prone. Okay, they might have had bad luck, but 
we didn't help them with getting them fitter quicker. Yeah. And that was just like, and then when I did my presentation, I was thinking, I'd love to go to Marcus now and actually get the opportunity. <laughs> to get. But unfortunately, I never got to use it. I've still got it on my computer. It was really good. Uh, but that was one thing I would always say, like, I, I, not many people know coming into the club how we haven't got great facility. Well, it's changed now because we've, we've built, it a, it, built it, it a cabin. So now the treatment room is massive. Four or five. Do you remember that when you used to, you used to walk in, if there's, if there's no injuries, I know you, would. you, 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 you you're sitting on, on the, on that ice box just around the corner or you're waiting and BY like, look BY to bits, like good physio. Like it was just, sometimes it was, four or five injuries, like six injuries that like there is a normal football club. Yeah. He was having to do this. And then Alex Chapman was there as well. But then he, when it's, when people are training, he's got to go outside and be available as a first aid and as things. So between half 10 and half 12, while the injured players meant to be doing the work, it's just be right there. He's running up and down from the gym. He's covered <laughs> in, he, he's strapping someone up. And you, and when you think back now at it and how it's thinking, like maybe, yeah. It should have been yeah, more. Like said, again, it's like like when you said about the lottery. Who knows if you fit? Who knows? But I'm saying, mm. let's give them the best possible chance to yeah. succeed and succeed. And if you're a championship club, and we've got one piece of machinery to treat players with, yeah, I don't think we even had an ultrasound machine. And even back in my time at the club in '97, '98, we had the the things where they used to suck and vibrate your leg. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ultrasound. We had more pieces of equipment then and now yeah. we're in 2015 baffled me it really did baffle me yeah yeah i remember that yeah. you make a point about you know saying take two hundred thousand pounds off the transfer budget and um put it towards that uh, i'm not sure that mick had two hundred thousand pounds off the transfer <laughs> yeah. budget anyhow yeah yeah yeah, yeah. True, that's you um I want to, so at the end of that 15 16 season, you came back, you scored a couple of goals at the end of the season. And I, and I know that you say that, you know, stats can kind of be unfair, but, you know, you had five five goals in, in 27 appearances, but still enough for you to be um, called up for uh, Ireland to play at home against the, the Netherlands in a, in a friendly uh, for the Euro 2016 warm up. You were subbed after 70 minutes. Did you feel that you'd done enough when you came off there? I thought I was in. Yeah, it was, it, it was funny because we played against Martin O'Neill, the great manager. He 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 works on the he, he got a lot of the cloughs, the Brian Clough about him. So when he names the team, he'll, he'll be like, right, the starting eleven, given uh, Coleman O'Shea. Um, so, but he won't tell you like where. It's just basically if you say your name and you start eleven. And kind of you know where he was, but he got down to the forward end. He was like McGoldrick. Um, I'm not sure who else it was, but he said like three or four strikers. And then I'm sitting there and I'm like, where, the f where, where am I playing? Like kind of thing. And I was in like midfield. I was, I was like in a three in the midfield. And I done quite all right. Um, I remember I got in the ball. I was doing things, and and I thought I did I had a good game. Um, and then after in the evening. I seen him, I seen Martin O'Neill in the corridor, like in the snacks, you know, like when you're in the snacks room and away in international career. And you know, I seen him, it was just me and him in there. And he's like, yeah, you, you bring something different, boy. Like, I'm really happy with you. Not like the other strikers, you know, you do this and and you do that, blah, blah, blah. I thought, I went back to my room thinking, I mean, I've been like, kind of the other days, I've been there, I'm going, I'm going away with, with Ireland. And then we played a game of, against Bulgaria, Cork, and I was an unused sub, and I thought, oh, and I thought he's going to use me. And then he threw me on like last 10 minutes, and then I, I kind of think to myself, hmm, why is he throwing me on for? I, uh, I don't know. It, that, that's when I kind of tricked me, thinking oh, there's something up then. And if I, that had to be in the squad, had to be announced at 11 o'clock, you wait for rules that night, had to be announced at half 11 or something. We were going to change after the game. There was 30 lads in Ireland, like the Ireland boys, no one knew who was making it. No one knew. No one's been told nothing. There was about half an hour left. One by one, whoever will get, will get called into his office around the corner. I was the last person to get called out. The last person at about quarter to 11 to, to get told that I wasn't, that wasn't making the squad. And he said it was the hardest thing um, he had to do, but he wanted to stay loyal to some of the boys that um, have been in the, the squads previously. And obviously Robbie Keane, Irish legend um, was coming back. He hadn't played many games. 
Um, so he was taking up one of the spots uh, as he should do. Um, so that kind of f took my spot basically. Um, I remember Murph. Murph had an absolute stinker in that Bulgaria game. He was horrendous. Mm -hmm. He could at half time, but they were going to keep went mental at him. And he was coming, I'm not in the squad. I, 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 I'm messed up. I'm not in the squad. Like, I'm done. I'm done. Uh, but he got it because he was. Uh, you you've done well before you were scoring goals before you uh, scored a goal before that um but yeah i thought i was in uh but it, it, it wasn't meant to be with that talking of ireland and the bad news and i think they had a a decent tournament didn't they it was yeah 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 that must have been making it make you feel even more sicker when you see the team doing yes. so well and one thing i will say about england scotland ireland northern ireland when they travel when they go away Trouble. take over and you'll see yeah. the bitches thinking wow yeah I'm watching it and I'm seeing when they beat Italy and that and Robbie Brady's going ahead of, and I'm just sitting there thinking wow and you've got the boys on your social media like platforms and you're seeing the private like, messages on the group st chat still like with the island group and they're all out and uh, having a great time after and you're sitting there thinking oh, I wish I was there but again me as a person that fuels me on to want to go get in the squad for the next time or, or whenever it may be. Another po polarising character, Roy Key. Obviously, it's Roy Key, yeah. Hey, some love him, Stat loves him, some hate him. Uh, I wasn't going to ask about him, him. I thought it would be too obvious. But How did you find him? You know, I got on really well with Roy. I, I, like, um, uh, I don't know why, if he gravitated me for a reason, um, I never had no like I've, I've seen things I've seen the angry side but I also seen like he's a funny guy like if you know like he, he's got one liners um, he tells he tells you stories like he could tell you he tells you stories he was telling me stories about when he played against Zidane and the only time he wanted to change shirts of him um, and I'm just there like a boy from from Nottingham like growing up seeing him play for Forest and the thing and I'm staring at him thinking listen to his stories like Go on, tell me more, tell me more. Like, and when he's training, he's zinging the balls at you, and you're like, Yeah, and he's like, Deal with it, deal with your professional footballer, deal with it. You're like, Bloody hell, but like later on, he talks to you, and I got on with him, but then I did see the other side of him. Like, I, I'm seeing the real, the, I can't go to too much, but yeah, I see the other side. I never had a problem with him, and I obviously coming from Ipswich, I would thought that he was going to have a problem with me because, you know, Mick McCarthy's son, and then obviously his problems with. Uh, would make their their relationship so I thought that he might but no I literally uh, I feel like he he liked me as a person and, and I had and, and I weren't going to have a problem with him because as to me as a respectful guy uh, there's a lot of footballers that have respect for people that have made it like about Blair Smart or, or Kieran though, like Kieran when he came to Ipswich I automatically had the respect for him as what he's done in the game so you listen to him Roy Keane like if you don't say one of the best players in the Premier League ever I'm going to listen to him and I'm going to respect him if you cross the line and whatever you, that happens then but as a man to man I'm going to respect the person in front of you for what he's done in the game and if you don't listen to him and you don't respect him then I can't respect a person that does that to another person anyway that's what you know, the young boys are like these days in my opinion anyway Fantastic well, August 16 speculation continues um, Sheffield Wednesday and, and Newcastle are, are reported to be interested in you how, how do you think Dids would have got on in, in Newcastle KD? As long as he didn't wear the number nine, because they think <laughs> yeah, yeah. they think a number nine has to be a sheer and score two hundred and fifty goals. If he'd have took the number nineteen, they would have loved him because he'd have been yeah, the yeah. player. But once you wear that number nine, mate, the uh, proof of that shirt is ridiculous up there. I would have refused uh, it. Yeah, <laughs> that's one thing I always say to people: they're a striker, you go to Newcastle, just refuse the number nine shirt. And you'll be fine. Um, yeah, I remember that. I remember the Newcastle thing. To be fair, and I think. Murph took the move not long after, I think. But yeah. when the Newcastle linked, it was only they're interested in you as you get throughout the thing. It was never no, I don't think there was no other interest or anything like, like proper calls or anything like that. So, yeah, Daryl Murphy uh, uh, went to Newcastle and your former strike partner, Leon Best, um, was, was was brought in. Um, I had a look, you, you, never, you never started a game with him, but how, how did it feel having a familiar face uh, with you again? Yeah, good. I, I got him. I got him the, the the. I think he came for training for a few days, basically. Um, but yeah, I was on to TC. He was on to me saying he wanted to come down. 
Um, and Leon, I knew him since I was a kid, growing up with him um, in my area in Nottingham. So I got him in. Uh, didn't work out for him. Um, I was going to say, you, you should, probably shouldn't have admitted that the fans won't love you now. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, uh, <laughs> we were short and we were short on a budget and, you know, Leon was free uh, and he came in. Um, and if you can get him to his best, like at times, like he's unplayable when he's at his best, but he just wasn't at the time. It didn't work out for him. Yeah, I don't think everyone's seen that wise, so yeah, it didn't work out. Um, October 2016, I remember this game. Um, you score a late equaliser at home to, to Rotherham in a 2-2 in a draw. When you scored, I looked at my son and I went, I ain't celebrating. Um, and half the fans didn't seem to as well. It was a kind of quite a polarising situation. How, how, what did it feel like you know, for you to score and, and half the, the fans not really being that interested? Yeah, I remember that. It was hostile around that time. I think a lot of the fans wanted Mick out them times. I think it was all the Mick out thing. And maybe if we lost to Rotherham, there were rumours, well, you know, I saved his job or whatever that game. But it was, yeah, it was hostile at times. You know, I, I get it. I get it. You know, when you're at the top and, you know, it's not attractive football as as, as fans want to see, you know, it's, when you're at the top, it's all right. But when you're not, you know, fans aren't, aren't going to like it and they've got every right to, you know, they, they, they've watched great football over the years. Um, but like, I, did I save his job and that? I don't know. But it wasn't nice. It wasn't a nice atmosphere at the time around the club. I know it got further and further on. I think the Brentford game or whatever, he might come to that. But I wasn't there. But obviously I heard, I, I read all about it. So it weren't great times in terms of atmospheres. And it was a bit strange scoring. And I know, I can remember actually, yeah, there weren't too many people jumping up either. I was pleased you scored. Just, yeah. Did you my... celebrate? No, I, I didn't get out of my chair. Uh, I, I looked at my son and I went, he is su such a lucky manager is what I thought. <laughs> that, do respect, Mick. Um, no, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, the, the, that season, uh, you, you were out for a little bit. You scored at, at, at Wigan in the DW Stadium in a, in a really uh, misty, foggy game. Um, but then you were out for a bit. You missed the Lincoln away game, which I was really gutted about because I want to kind of ask you about, you know, Lincoln away and the FA Cup when I thought that that was um, Mick's final game in, in charge. And what, what was the, the general mood? Did, was, was that the end? Did people think it was the end after that game? It's hard, it's hard to like put a trigger on it when people think like it was the end. I know that he was getting asked questions and people was calling for him. Like, I do remember that. I just don't remember like actually actually the, the time of, of that the Lincoln game. I remember what I was injured, but I was watching it on telly. Like, I remember they were taking corners and it's like sirens going off or something in the background or something like whenever they take a throw in or a corner at the Lincoln ground. But no, it weren't great times. It was hostile. Um, I think Bestie played up front that game actually. Um, was his last remember. game? His last was game. <laughs> okay. Yeah, out. <laughs> 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 Uh, no, it was hostile. Um, I'm going to keep saying that. I can remember it. It went uh, from the atmosphere, from, like you say, the Fulham game at the start of the season where, you know, Mick McCarthy gives away and Terry Connor and that, and then to what it was at the end. You know, it hurt me because I, I had a lot of respect for, even though whatever happened throughout the seasons, and I always had respect, and I still do this to this day for, for Mick. He's done a lot for me. He changed my career from coming from Cobb to learning a different, he grew me up as a man as well. And I feel like, a lot of respect and mannerism I had as a man. And if I was ever to go into to coaching and management, which I don't think I will, but it would be, be tr truthful and say it how it is. Because I think as a player, I think you get managers that talk rubbish to you and feed you like all sorts of, but one thing, if you went to Mick, he would always tell you the truth. And if you didn't like it, didn't like it. Like he, he, he would, he would go in a, if it was a boxing ring, he'd probably try going to the boxing ring with you. Like, it wouldn't get to that, but he was so truthful. And if he didn't like it, he didn't like it. And that's one thing I always have respect for him about. Do you feel he was, again, you've said you've got a lot of respect for him. Do you feel he was unfairly treated or could you understand why the fans, because the fans probably haven't got the knowledge that he's got the lowest budget. I've talked about the treatment room situations and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Can you see why the friends were frustrated with Mick? Do you just think they, they, it was time for him to go, or do you feel still feel he was hardly treated, uh, harshly treated? I feel a bit of both, and that's not me sitting on the fence or anything like that. I get exactly why the fans felt what they like do it. I do generally get that, but at the same time, 
like the budget and the stuff that Mick was working with, he, I don't think he could have changed much. That was Mick's style of play. That's how he wanted to play and it got his results. He's never changed it. He's been promoted from the Championship. He's been in the Premier League, does he? Did it when he went to Republic of Ireland when they got them so far the first time. That's just how he is. And that's what he, he can't really change that because he's gave him so much success. So I do get why the fans wasn't happy with it. And it, it's when you're not when you're not winning, it's it's not great to watch. And if players are playing poorly and you know, times when you go to get the ball and you're giving it away and the fans are, are booing you, or not booing you, but like you hear the jeers or you hear something, it takes a strong character to go and pick up that ball again. As you know, like it takes a strong character, but, and I don't think there was enough. You know, they was getting on fans, pe players were getting it. Um, and, you know, it shows you a lot about as a man, as a character, as you, as if you can take that. And not many, not many could, you know, and obviously the real leaders there, the, the Chambers and that, they definitely could. And they was, they was up against it all the time, um, even himself as playing all them games. But I do get the fans a thing, but I honestly uh, Mick put all his effort into it. Never changed um, the budget that he was on. Our, our, our championship budget wages wise was nowhere near some of the teams that was fighting there. Um, but I can see it. Yeah, it's, I can see it from both sides, and that's just not me just sitting on the fence over. Yeah. Jumping to to June that summer. Um, just want to ask you about this. You, you played in a friendly for Ireland against Mexico in the, the MetLife Stadium in New Jersey. What was that experience like? I want to worth nights in my life. Worth nights in my life. We, I'd play against Mexico. We get to this. We get to the New York, the stadium. It's like this big wall, and it's about when you get there. The game normally you see a few fans dotted around, like and everything. About 20,000 like Mexico fans in there. I'm thinking, oh, they're there a bit early, like kind of thing. Like you're warming up a bit more. By the end of the warm up, they're doing a the samba, they're doing the Mexican wave. Like it's the place is full, like completely full. Go out to the game, we get absolutely popped. Like I couldn't string a pass together. There was what's the old what's the old Brazilian, the old Mexican guy who's played for uh, Barcelona, uh, Kieran? You might know him, Marquez. Marquez, he couldn't, move. he couldn't move, he was playing DMF, he was getting it, he was popping it, I was trying to get around him, I got nowhere near him, you got like the Santa, I think, um, every time, um, Chik Chikori, what, the Man United guy? Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Chikori, uh, yeah. He, yeah, he wasn't even playing, he wasn't even playing, but he used to go get warmed up, and the crowd was open and then like it was Mexican way. we was like this, this part of an exhibition basically <laughs> literally like part of an exhibition it, it, we got battered and like, I actually thought that like, I might never play for Ireland again I was horrendous you didn't um, take a trip to the meatpacking district afterwards for a night out then it was get your much. head down get, <laughs> get, it was literally get your head down and reevaluate if you can play football ever again because <laughs> you was horrendous <laughs> 2017-18, your your last season with the club and starts off with a with a bang. In comes Joey Garner and Martin Waghorn. He's got his four strikers with the, with you and 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 Sears. Selena comes in. Douglas come. No, he, he was there. Two, he was there the year before, I think. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Did you rate him? Me? Yeah, I did. I did. I did. I did. I definitely did. And that yeah, I did. Yeah, I'm not sure KD did. Did you? Uh, next question. Okay, so you... <laughs> hey, <laughs> I, 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 but again, I don't see the training every day. I don't see the little things. I'm only yeah. seeing Ipswich now and again. Like yeah. I said, sometimes why players appre appreciate the fans, uh, the players' player of the year rather than the fans. There's no disrespect to the fans. It's because the players see it every day. They see what you're going through, playing with injury. They, they, they see everything, so... Mm -hmm. Did he say and there was something about him then? Yeah. I can I can definitely vouch for that. I, I weren't there every day. I'm just seeing him and the Mick and the fans having a power battle over Jonathan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that and you just yeah I, remember, I remember that. I remember all yeah. that, yeah. A great start to the season. Town win uh, their first five. You've scored three. Garner's scored three. Uh, Martin Waghorn scored four. 
Um, you scored two in a in a, actually. I want to speak to you about the two that you scored against Luton in the in the League Cup, and you you dedicated the goals to to Andre Dizel. Was there any words of, of wisdom and advice you you could, you gave him at that time? No, not really. Um, obviously, that's when he just did it, did his injury, wasn't it? I remember. Um, I know he, he was vouch when his dad will vouch for it. I think I, I went and dropped him home after I was meant to be at the time of a family. I was meant to dro- drive back to Nottingham that night, but I stayed with Andre after the game and I dropped him home to his family home, um, making sure like he was getting back. I'm not sure how he was meant to get back or something, but I think I had a bigger car to get him back. And, you know, I just felt for the boy cut. Like, I got a lot of time for his dad. You know, as his Kieran, his dad's a, his dad's a top guy. Um, Met with him loads of times in Ipswich and always seen him. So I, I felt like he was, I was kind of looking after him a little bit. Um, so yeah, I dedicated the goals to him that night. Um, but he's still playing now, so it's, it's not like an RIP or anything, was it? Um, but yeah, it's scored two good goals. And I started well that year, yeah. I had, uh, like I said, I was coming to my last year, my contract, and I knew I had to, to do something to either earn a contract at Ipswich or, you know, get myself. Um, People wanted to take me when the contract finished. After the five wins, in, in the first five wins in the at the start of the season, we then lose eight of the the next eleven, um, including another one 0 defeat at home to to Norwich. You know, did did you feel that anything was different? You know, was it was it hard for for Mick McCarthy now that he had Waghorn and he had Garner and he had you certainly at the start of the season scoring goals? Was it? Because you seem to suddenly find yourself out in the wing in some games and stuff like that. Yeah, maybe he might have been trying to get us all in. Um, I think Waggy was doing Waggy was doing well. Um, Garner, uh, he he had a bit of everything that Mick liked. You know, he, he was a small boy, but he, he had a bite about him, and he was good in the air. And I think maybe at that time. The fans might have wanted me to play, so he was might find a way. Or Mick would have wanted me to play, so he was trying to find a, a place for me to play. And it was on the wing, and I don't mind playing out on the wing. It wasn't working all the time, um, but yeah, I think he was just trying to find formation to get some of the best attackers. Um, we had a club for the past couple of years before that because they were really good players on the pitch at that time. November twenty seventeen, Glenn Glenn Leuven's with a horrific challenge on you I don't think you even got booked in that game you you missed five matches after that and mm. as a fan what kind of happens after that do, do you get like a mobile for you do you get a call from Glenn to say oh, I'm really sorry about you know what went what went on after that uh, uh, Giles Coke was at the club at the time and he come from Sheffield Wednesday so Glenn Lovens text Cokey to say sorry but it wasn't a direct text to me but yeah Remember that I was in A and I was in surgery the next day. I had a tackle in my finger. I didn't realise at the time. I knew something was sore, but you just thought of one of them. And I remember I looked down and my had this big wound right close to my private parts. It was open, like deep cut. And I remember I opened, like I took my slips down at half time. And I remember BY's face, like it was literally like, what the hell is that? And I was like, no, be, I'm cool. must be the longest in the shower. That's why his face is. Like <laughs> I think it's because he, he, he could. I think he could. He could see it. I think it was the way around. He could see it. <laughs> uh, literally, yeah. So I was in. I was having surgery the next day. I remember that. Um, it was a nasty gash, and I tried to play on. I said I wanted to play on. I came out half time. I jogged out the tunnel, and I turned around and jogged back, and I said, absolutely no chance. I remember that game, yeah. January 2018, even even more speculation, and at this time Mick McCarthy um, confirms that that Bolton were were interested in you. Um, was there any talk that a deal was on the table at all? No, uh, no, not from my knowledge. No, uh, not that I can remember. I can remember the other clubs, but I don't remember the Bolton thing really. February, you returned to the squad. You had a, a knee injury that missed two games. And then you came on as a second half sub away away to Norwich. Um, that was your ended up being your last game for town. And but most fans will remember that game for for Mick McCarthy's reaction. Um, obviously, Chambo scored what we thought was going to be a a late winner. Um, what was your general kind what of? Did he give it? Yeah, he, he told us to. Um, 
uh, in, in Mick McCarthy's words, I think he told us to foxtrot Oscar. I think that was the phrase. <laughs> yeah, I love that word, yeah. Uh, yeah, I remember that. Um, that's just that's just Mick McCarthy for you. He's passionate and, you know, you know, a lot of managers would have backed down at the time. Like, you got in them kind of abuse and that kind of stuff. A lot of managers wouldn't have been able to... Uh, but he could. Fans didn't like him. He might have thought, well, F... F, F you basically um, but who to know but yeah, that's just me like, I just laugh about it now obviously fans can't really laugh about it but I can laugh at the time now looking back I just I just know what he's like as a person and then like Fox Truck Austria yeah like if he used to say it to train all the time yeah when did the players uh, get wind that uh, that he said it because it was obviously on Sky is it when you um, get social media or no one knew anything about it until I think it was on the bus. I think it was on the bus after the game, yeah. You know, you're waiting around after Norwich game and I think, yeah, we seen it on the bus and it was like, oh, God, like kind of thing. <laughs> so after that Norwich game, you were you were injured in, in training. You tore a tendon in your groin. In, in April, Mick McCarthy quit. Brian Clue came in as a caretaker manager. And then obviously Paul Hurst was um, un unveiled in, in the summer as the manager was... Did you have any conversations with Paul Hurst at all about your future? No, I didn't. I didn't have no conversation with him. I got my agent because um, I had a conversation with Mick before he left or whatever. And he was just like, I don't know what's happening with you. You're going to have to leave it to the new manager. So I um, I was training at St. George's Park at that time, actually. To get, yeah, to, to, my A license yeah. around the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so I went to St. George's Park. I got fit and then so I wasn't really around the place never met Paul Hurst I remember my agent messaged him what's the situation with McGoldrick like and the response was no there's nothing changed with Dave McGoldrick he's fine he's free to find another club and my agent still got that message on his phone mm. he would text me every now and then just to remind me <laughs> wow well you, you you finished your your career at, at Ipswich 100 and 59 appearances and, and 45 goals and obviously a great deal of, you know, un unluck, um, you know, bad luck with, with injuries and stuff like that. Because I, re I reckon you could have easily, probably could have easily got another 20 odd goals, which would put you, you know, 20 or 30 goals to put you in the top 10, you know, league goal scorers for, for Ipswich. Um, so we've, we've gone through your time. And one of the things that I want to do just at the end is just rattle off a, a, a few questions from, from fans. I think we might have covered a few. Um, but uh, Chris Peachy said, were you ever forced to play whilst not being 100%? Not forced, no. I would have played when not 100% fit, but forced to play, no. Like, I'm definitely on the pitch when I wasn't 100% fit, yeah. Uh, Joey Sadler said, did you ever feel settled in Ipswich? Yeah, I did. As a family, when my family was here, like, you, and that's what I, I liked when I came because I left Nottingham and around your friends and doing, going out when you shouldn't be. Like, I actually lived, liked it, like living there, you know, going to the Aqua 8 restaurant, uh, going for food. I had friends that was down, lived in, in Chelmsford, we used to go see them all the time. And we was actually really settled. So this whole perception that I was never settled, like, I don't know where it's come from. Aqua 8 is done now. Finished. You're done? Yeah, finished when the COVID's, when COVID come. Oh, it's no. Yeah. yeah. So you, definitely, you wouldn't have been settled. <laughs> yeah, no, no, that's it. No, I would have been gone. Yeah. Uh, Wazza, Wazza asked, can you ask him why he was always so desperate to leave us and why did you never say goodbye? That really hurt. But then he adds on that you were one of the best and most technically gifted strikers that we've had at Ayerswich for many, many years. <laughs> I never would. Any time was when I... When the Leicester thing that any person with any drive would have wanted to do. Other than that, I never have to leave. I signed the contract. And even though the contract got announced, that was a three-year deal. I signed the contract before that, but it just never got an announced. Um, they were going to announce it in the summer for like fair financial fair play. I don't know, about for the league or something. But I was always committed after that. I was always committed. I never have to leave. Never asked you to go to Newcastle, Sheffield Wednesday, Bolton. It was just something jumped up that will take your career to another thing. And if you wouldn't want to leave then, then I don't know why you want to be a professional that wants to get higher. So to answer to, what's his name? Loz or was whatever. Then, was a, was a. 
So was yeah. uh, is, you're making stuff up there, was I? There you go, Wazza, you got your answer. Harry Mallett wants to know, were the tra what were the training sessions like at Ipswich under Mick McCarthy and how did they differ from your time at other clubs? Um, I was with him for five years, so there's only so many sessions that coach can can change every day. So we did a lot of the same things. There's always young, be old on a Friday with trainer, um, get the thing for the game. Um, maybe 11 be living on a Tuesday. But yeah, it was, it was pretty... It was, pretty, it was good. I liked it. went went hard. Pre-season was tough. Like any, it was just normal training. I got no answer for that, really. Uh, Tom Bradford, uh, what's your best McCarthy story? Mm. Oh, yeah. Um, McCarthy stories. Um, not many McCarthy stories. More TC. TC's got a little bite on him. I've seen him stroll across the pitch when went after a player like and you would a, a proper unit as well as a player TC like why not answering me but he strolled across the pitch and it was a bit like oh like he's he used to give some players some mixed stories you can go on like he, was, he gives bollocking shit but that's what he is that's, and but apparently he calmed down a lot from when he was younger as well ITFC Jude Ben Moore and Francis Britton said who was the best player that you played with at town Ugh. They're all going to be watching this, aren't can't, they? Can't be like, can't have loan players. Can't have loan players. No. We can come back to that one while you're thinking about it. Yeah, I think I think I got it because of what he did. Who was it? It's probably I love to I love you know what actually no best technical and best probably player for probably crazy. Mm. Crazy like. He, he he was too good, and that's why he is like he, his distribution. I'm gonna say Murph because what he did, and I love playing with him. And we had the combination like that, that was about a doubt, but a sheer ability like crazy. Like as a striker, when I was dropping the holes, he used to just zing the ball into your feet. That when like obviously we used to play the ball in the channels, but they weren't channel balls. They were rolled in the corner like into your stride. Like yeah, yeah, crazy was really good. Did you think Flynn Downs would have the career he's had? Ability wise, mm -hmm. I knew he had something. I knew it. But I, I I don't know how much you would think Miami said. I don't think he was mentally strong enough when he was at Ipswich. I don't think he was mentally strong enough. Um, and he's gone away. A lovely lad, gone away. And I see him play last season for for Swansea, and I was like, Phew. He's, he's arrived. Like yeah, yeah he, he, he he's got everything now. He was a boy. Is he from it? Where's he? Is he? Uh, is he's he, from, he's, 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 he is a West Ham fan. He's from. Yeah, he's a, he's a London boy. Side, yeah, London sides. Yeah. Yeah, but I just don't think when he was getting, I don't think he was ready. And obviously, I see he was playing for Ipswich when I left, like a bit more regular and that. But at a time when I was there, mentally, he wasn't ready. Um, but then I've seen him since. Yeah, and mm. fair play, lovely lad as well, lovely kid. I'll just rattle a few of these questions off now. Uh, Ian Wallbank. Uh, who was the longest in the showers? Uh, J-Tab. That fits a little bit what James Norwood said. About, <laughs> uh, talking about proportion and stuff like that of players. I think I'm think i not of... having J-Tab as the longest in the shower. I'm sorry. I'm just not having it. Uh, Gear and he was in the shower for ages, mate. <laughs> <laughs> he was in the shower for ages, mate. Uh, uh, was Chambo the best captain you played with? That was from Chris Bennett. Uh, yeah, yeah, for way different the lads than that. Yeah, um, I don't think he was my captain, he was part of the time captain at Forest, um, Chef United, Sharpie. Now, Billy Sharp is the same, Billy Sharp and Chamber are the same characters. Um, they're both really good. Um, so I'll say one of them to you. Um, two last questions. Uh, KB, uh, basically saying, did, did you sense the club was in trouble, you know, towards the end of you know, when Waghorn went, Joey Garner went? you went did, did you kind of see in your mind where where we were heading yeah yeah i did they got rid of they get rid of webby that summer as well yeah <laughs> yeah they got rid of they got rid of waggy webby and obviously they gambled and brought paul hearse in you know i'm sitting back and i'm watching and i'm seeing through the signings and i think the league got good that league went up a notch that year but have you seen the results and then you was thinking yeah, yeah. They had, a, they had a tough time and I didn't like it um, but you could kind of sense it I know there was, there was 
cutting the budget as well to what it was for Mick. To be fair to Paul Hurst, I think they cut the budget more than what Mick had his budget. So I think he was under more under more scrutiny in the wages wise. So it, it was tough. And it, the last question isn't actually is a question. It's a it's a it's a request, which is please don't score against us next season. <laughs> I can't make no promises. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I understand you're a professional footballer I get that <clears throat> thank you ever so much for your answer is completely different to um, Norris with this scoring against Ipswich today because he said if he comes back and scores depending on the crowd's reaction to him he said if they were to boo him then he'd definitely yeah. be great if they showed a bit of respect he would but you have yeah yeah no, I hear that I'm, I'm, I'm not going to say would, that would, would, would no would get booed if he came back 100%. <laughs> yeah, I think so. He's a, he is, we talked to, you mentioned Marmite quite a bit on here and some fans liked him and some didn't like him. Um, oh, I thought, I thought, yeah, I thought he was like, not, I thought the fans really took him at the... Yeah, no, I, I, yeah. I, I think there would be a few. Um, well, let, let, let's hope that maybe you do score in, in, in a three, one victory for it switch. Um, and you, you get the, you get the consolation goal for, mm. for Derby. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you ever so much for, for, for coming on. Really appreciate it. Really appreciate the time, you know, that you've, you've given us certainly in the, the whirlwind 24, 48 hours that you, you've had with us. So thanks very I, much. for coming. Yeah. I just want to finish with a last story as well. So uh, not many fans know the, like the good insights. So, and it will come to a shock that when Paul Cook was manager of the football club, obviously it's tech board, which is basically equivalent of head tennis. He was in the top three players still at head tennis. Uh, Paul tech, Cook. Paul Cook. He used to batter players who were playing today. And like fans are going, what? Our players listen yeah, to yeah. Cook. And when Mick was in charge, there was Lids who we used to do. Yeah, 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 yeah. And Lids was unbelievable at head tennis he beat every single player in the football cl club except for one man did he used to just batter him <laughs> he's still got the crowd is well, still, well, still got the crowd yeah. you're, still you're, still the best. you're still the best Literally, one person ever. one person and he beat him yeah with me yeah <laughs> yeah it's unbelievable like fans will think oh, i can fit this coaches but they obviously yeah. still got the football pedigree and then because they're always yeah. in the gym or always do it yeah, yeah. yeah. Always doing it. Always have to come along and just put him in his place. You were the only yeah. player. Yeah, that's the best achievement at Ipswich. There. <laughs> yeah, but that um, one of the biggest compliments I can. Pack, well, you might not say it's a compliment because it has been doom or gloom since 2010. But I think you've probably been in the top two or three players, Ipswich Town players, since 2010 onwards. Uh, you were an actual player that got us off our seats. Very creative and. It was a shame that, like you said, you didn't have the luck going your way with some of your injuries and that, but you still like to score 45 goals. You must be up there in the goal-scoring charts. Is he stat for Ipswich players? 30, 31st in the all-time goal yep. scoring and 27, I think, in the in the, the league goal scoring. That's mm. an achievement to be proud of as well, don't you? Mm. Definitely. Yeah, you've got you've, you've got a career at Ipswich that you rightly to be proud of. Um, yeah, certainly yeah. one of my fa favourite players. Um, and thank you. Wish, thank you for your time and wish you the best of luck next season. No, it's my pleasure. I'll see you Except soon. against Ipswich. <laughs>